Welcome to another episode of the Gay Barchive Show, where we explore gay history one bar at a time. I'm your host, Art Smith, and today we're being joined by former nightclub operator, impresario, and godfather of the nightlife industry, the legendary Steve Lewis. Welcome to the show, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's How are you doing? doing? I'm doing great. And it's great I am to too. have someone like you here who has such a long and colorful history in the New York <laughs> club scene. Wow, well, thank you. Every time someone calls me a legend, I check my pulse to see if I'm still alive. <laughs> well, you know, we have a lot of living legends out there. You've got, you know, Cher yeah. and, and Elton John and Madonna. So you fit right in with that crowd. Oh, that's real. That's a good crowd. I don't mind. All right, then. So tell us a little bit about your start in the club industry in New York. I started, uh, I started doing fashion shows for a living. I, I uh, helped, I, I assisted on one. A uh, big show at Bond's Disco, which was a great club. And uh, from there, I did 400 shows. And from there, I took a job with Rudolph at Dance Interior because I wanted to do my fashion shows at Dance Interior. And I, I started doing them there, and it helped me. I, I was very successful. And uh, they were great. I had fun. Nightlight was very different then for me, but I was younger. And I think now it's good for the young people, but I don't relate to it as much. Yeah, well, New York's had a pretty vibrant scene over the years. There's a lot of um, kind of world famous clubs that have been there and made a big mark on um, on not just gay history, but but club history in general. Yeah, and you've been a part of a lot of those. Um, I, I think I've been part of most of them. Yeah, area I wasn't part of, but I went there. It was great. I think it was the best club. Studio 54 I was part of. I didn't go to it. I I, I like Steve Rebell. I, I went once, they say. I don't remember. But it must have been good. And all, all the clubs. But I ran the Palladium for Steve when it was a, it was a great club. It was the best club in New York for many years. It was a, the best design club. And I, I, design, I, I ran it for Ian Schrager. And uh, Steve Rebell, and they were incredible people. So let's let's talk about the Palladium. Yeah. Um, first of all, how big was the Palladium? It was one hundred eight thousand square feet of usable space. It was probably more of that in the uh, in the pipe, but it wasn't usable. But we had a giant room which held four thousand, five thousand people. We had the Michael Todd room which held another 800 to 1,000 people. And we had a basement, which was a, a vault, which was incredible, held 500 people. And we filled it up most nights. We really did. Yeah, I've seen tons of pictures of it. The, uh, the main room that you talked about the, with the dance floor and everything is yeah. iconic. I mean, you cannot, you know, in the 70s and early 80s, people had that stupid... Um, Saturday night fever dance floor everywhere, and you had huge walls uh, that resembled that with the, the light up blocks and everything. That's right. You can't miss that. Was them. great. We had a full tech crew. We had 10 people working on tech, uh, running things. We had things flying in, flying out. We had big video monitors. I haven't seen anything like that since. And as I recall, um, Palladium also had a pretty colorful history with artists that have since become extremely, extremely famous. We, um, we had John Michelle Basquiat in the uh, Michael Todd room, giant images on the wall. We had uh, Keith Haring at a giant 100 foot high uh, painting behind the dance floor you could see. We had uh, David Spain, a great, great, Jewelry design of the staircases, which were beautiful. Uh, and Arako Arasawa did the, uh, did the ar architecture, which was beautiful. And Kenny Sharp did the basement. Kenny was great. Uh, it, was a, it was an iconic club based on art. Art was breaking out that time. And I, uh, I remember that we didn't buy the paintings. We rented them from the artists. We gave them $25,000 for four years. 
and they owned it, but we use them. Whatever happened with that gigantic uh, Keith Haring mural? I hear it's still around, but I don't know what happened to it. The Palladium, uh, Palladium went down fairly fast and fairly hard, and we sort of let, lost track of everything. The next owners were, uh, were Alan Cohen and, and Pete Frankel, and I had a, I, I used Stephen Sprouse, a sculpture, a giant sculpture in sort of two dimensional uh, of him on a cross, which replaced Keith Haring and many other artists. Now, what kind of crowd did you draw at Palladium? A mixed crowd. That's a thing that people don't understand about clubs today and clubs in the old days. Everything was gender fluid before the, word, the phrase was invented. There was no thing as gay and straight. There were gay people and straight people, but everybody was sort of gender fluid and it seemed natural. The crowd was uh, smaller. We didn't have as many people going out. Now you have Mirage and all these other clubs in, in Brooklyn and, and Manhattan is with private clubs. We didn't have that back then. We had the Palladium and two or three smaller ones. It was, had to be smaller. And it was a great crowd. And everybody was mixed. And everybody accepted gay people. And everybody accepted gay nightlife and straight nightlife. But they mixed. There was no question that they mixed. There were gay nights at places like the Paradise Garage and, and other places. Mark Berkeley and, and John Blair through what would be predominantly, predominantly uh, gay nights. Uh, they were just Chelsea A which was great, but they were not what we were trying to do. And it, it, in our world, you had to be mixed or you didn't get in. If, if you didn't understand the gay crowd, if you didn't accept the great crowd, we, we stopped at the door. Yeah, I've read a similar, uh, similar quote by uh, Peter Gation, who said that, you know, when he was doing the limelight, and I know you worked with that as well, that yeah. um, he wanted a mixture. He didn't want all gay. He didn't want all straight. He didn't want all drag queens. He wanted 20% of everything. And, yeah. um, and I think in New York, especially, I had this conversation with Ernie Glam uh, during his interview that uh, the club kid scene was a big part of that because the club kids were hard partiers. They were dedicated to going out and being extravagant and having a good time. And they were, by definition, gender benders. I mean, their Absolutely. outfits crossed all the lines, but nobody assumed that they were gay or they were straight or they were bi. They just assumed they were party animals. And, you know, that's what the scene was about. I think so. I think Michael Allen, who was my partner at that time, we were partners. We ran the, uh, the Palladium together and we did uh, almost everything together until he went bad. And when he went bad, he went really bad and he couldn't be saved. But he was gay. And he ran uh, what the club kid parties, and he was very successful. We didn't make any money on Michael. The gay crowd, the club kid crowd, never spent a dime. But people who came to see them spent money, and they they were. It was like having hundred go go dancers, and you didn't have to really pay that much for them because they just had fun. Now, for for clubs like the Palladium. They were more of a, um, a democratic society, from what I understand, than, for instance, you mentioned Studio 54. Studio 54 seemed to be all about your credentials and your heritage and how, how big your name was on the movie marquee, whereas the other clubs like Limelight and Palladium, they seemed to be more, you know, a taste of everything. I, I, I take some credit for that because I didn't. I, I, I'm from poor roots, and I accept that. But Palladium was very uptown. It was on 54th Street, and it had a natural uptown crowd, and people wore suits and stuff. But Steve Rebell himself was very gay, and he had a very great core crew of Yoko Ono and Elizabeth Taylor and Keith Haring and all those people. And they attracted a great crowd. And there it was gender fluid. In the, within the Palladium, it was say a thousand really hot gay people running around having a great time. So it always had a gay element. It always was mixed. 
but it wasn't a mix like downtown. When we were downtown, it was far easier to get the East Village to come. And that was a big gay crowd, an artist crowd. And we, we exploited that. We wanted that. And that's it. It was great. What was the challenge like uh, when you started working with Palladium on a venue that large? Because as, as you know, and I know, most of the gay clubs back in the 70s and 80s tended to be much, much smaller. There were some discos that were relatively large, but even then, five or 10,000 square feet was considered a good sized club. And you're talking about a club that is 10 or 20 times that size. I mean, this is a massive, massive. We had, we had great marketing. I, I ran the marketing. I, I got to take some credit. We did uh, 5,000 people on a, an average. And I remember doing 5,000 people in the snow one day for a really big fashion show. And I was almost crying and I felt so bad. And they told me, are you crazy? You're 5,000 people. That's more people than anybody else has. I, I didn't realize that. But what we did was we sent mailing lists. We had a mailing list that had 162 different lists on it. It had yuppies who went to art parties. We had uh, East Village artists who went to a, a certain art party. We had straights. We had this. And what we did was we mailed about... 50,000 mail, mail, uh, mails out. We used to mailing back then. We didn't have email. And we send them all out, and they came back. They really did, because you got invited back then. Nobody saw an invite, and we wanted to come. But we did, what we did, we told the doorman what crowd we invited. And the doorman's job was to look for that crowd. And I would supervise that, make sure we didn't get too many of this or too many of that. And we uh, kept it nice. It was a, the best thing about the, the, the Palladium was the door. The door, the door became, was my signature. I think we did it really better there than uh, the clubs before us. Now, what was it like for you coming from a modest background to go into a palatial club like that and be dealing with people who, um, some of whom were either very wealthy or, or felt very entitled? How did, how did you interact with that crowd? I had no problem with it. I, I enjoyed it. The whole thing was, it was a, it was a, it was a merry-go-round. It was spinning on me, and I, I didn't know which way was up and which way it was out. I knew that I was. So I never lost track of my roots, my Jackson Heights roots. And in Jackson Heights, as you know, a mixed crowd. It was always a gay crowd, even in the fifties. I had a gay, a gay a mailman. Uh, and we, we, we accepted it. I didn't know any better. I thought it was always natural to be gender fluid because that's the way I grew up. And so I applied that to everyone else. And they had to listen to me or they, they didn't have a good time. They didn't get in. If they were difficult, they didn't get in. But I think my roots, my parents were very influential. They helped me a lot. And they helped me love the people. I think you had to give love in or you got a shitty crowd. And you had some interesting characters um, in New York City at that time. I know in the early 80s, I was in um, Atlanta. And we had some extreme uh, performers there that eventually migrated to Atlanta. When I, Larry interviewed, when I interviewed Larry T, he told me the story about uh, piling into a minivan with uh, Lahoma and RuPaul, packing up whatever meager belongings they, be yeah. they owned and trekking up to New York City. And um, at that time, a lot of people that are younger do not realize this. But at that time, RuPaul was basically kind of a club kid, go-go boy. He wasn't. She was always a little aloof. She was always a little bit at it. I respect Ru. And she mentioned me the other day on some TV interview. Where I, and I felt good that she knew who I was. But uh, she was always a bit part. But it was also, they traveled to New York. I think I had Miss Margie with them. I don't think that she gets enough credit. But she was a woman, uh, fabulous, uh, dressed in rockabilly. And she was great. And she was part of their crew. And they had a good crew. The Homer was unbelievably great. And Larry T was Larry T. Larry was unbelievable. He really was an important figure. I was partners with Larry and Michael uh, at the Palace de Butte which is where uh, the Petco is on Union Square. And Annie Warhol lived upstairs. 
Yeah, Andy Warhol was a big part of that scene back then as well. Yes, he was. Deborah Harry. Yeah, I I have Andy tattooed on my arm here, his signature. I got I got that while I was DJing because I you had, you couldn't do anything but like Andy. I'm sure he had his faults, but I didn't see him. And I remember one time I was being interviewed by somebody, and uh, they asked Andy why I was at this fashion show, and Andy said because I like Koshin Sato and Don Johnson wears Koshin Sato. And the reporter said, uh, what does Don Johnson have to do with it? And he said, well, I look like John, John Johnson. And I started laughing. And Wilfredo at that time looked at him. And we all looked at him. The reporter went away uh, flabbergasted. And I, I, I was accepted by Andy because I, was, I could play the game. And Andy was about that. And all you needed was a white linen suit and a red Ferrari. <laughs> a red Ferrari? Ferrari? Isn't that what Don Johnson had in Miami Vice? What's I, like Don, I don't know. I didn't pay much attention to John Johnson. <laughs> so after yeah. you made, made your mark on the Palladium, where'd you go next? Uh, when I go after the plane. I think I went to the Palace, the Palace de Butte, which was really great. That was with RuPaul and, and Larry and Jelly Bean Benitez and uh, Ed, uh, lots of pe good people. It was a natural fit. It was the old underground. And what happened was they made a deal with the community board that they couldn't get shut down because they were changing their MO because the underground was really rough. And I, I took that over. I, I invested all my money into that place. And uh, in six months, um, Kelly Tr Catrone was my publicist. And they they went on, some New York State Senate went on TV and said, we got to shut this place down. And Kelly punched him on TV. And he shut the, uh, he shut the uh, Palace of Bude town. Then I was in trouble because I, I didn't have a place. So all of a sudden, I invested all my money. And uh, we were making even. We had a gay night, which was rare for me. But I had to Sunday, uh, and I had a. I was packed every day of the week. I did Wednesdays with Gigi and Moby, and Madonna used to hang out, and the crowd was great. And we, in fact, we uh, premiered Vogue by uh, by her. It was a great song, and I was into voguing at that point. I went to all the balls. I was a judge at some of the balls, and I, I really loved the extravaganzas. I, I thought they were wonderful people. I, I thought at that time nobody paid attention to them, but I did, and I gave them a place in my club. Uh, I remember um, Moby the Grape, or whatever his name was, Alexander the Grape was my go-go dancer. He was fabulous. And then we went to, uh, I guess after that, I had to make a decision where I would go, and I went to the red zone after that. And that was pretty good, too. And these are all club names that people will know. They're not a little hole-in-the-wall, flash-in-the-pan thing that nobody's ever heard of. I mean, no. if you're talking about, about uh, club history in New York City, you know, people know these names. They know these places. Well, I ran 20 nightclubs. And uh, I think they're all very good. I mean, my last great club would have to be the world would be in there, 87 of the world. That was a great club. And uh, I did Red Zone. And after that, I, I mean, I did so many clubs. I had so much. What did you say? Club USA, USA Palladium, uh, Tunnel. I mean, they're all giant clubs. We had to do three, 4,000 people. Lucy, I was responsible for doing that. And I had to do it. I had to do it every night. Now, the Tunnel was the complete opposite of the Palladium as far as grandeur is concerned. Yes, it You're was. going from Palladium, which is kind of a, a palace, a huge yeah. kind of cathedral type, gigantic space into the tunnel, which granted was a very large space, but it was an underground railway storage area that was used for, um, for holding freight and trains. Trains. In the early days, I was approached by um, 
uh, one of the Jordax kids. I was running something else. And I was doing fast shows, and he wanted me to run it. I couldn't run it, so I gave it to Rudolph. And Rudolph ran it. And then after a while, I took it over for Rudolph. And I met with Steve Rebell, and he gave it to me over Eric Good and Howie Montour. Howie was, was our doorman. And I got the job, and that was an unbelievable job. But the tunnel was industrial. At that time, industrial looked steel. Uh, it became very popular. And I ran the tunnel. It was a, an honor. It was a great club. And we did all, we had so many rooms. I think we had seven dance floors at one point. And uh, it was very, very great. We had seven different types of music. And everybody had to be great or you didn't get in. And uh, that was a great club. I, I miss the tunnel. I, I, I hear it's still there. I may go visit it one of these days. But, you know, now when it was you, a great club. When you got involved with the tunnel, had, had it just been newly con uh, converted to a nightclub? Was that the first iteration of a yeah. nightclub in that space? Yes, it was. Ellie Diane, that's who it was, Ellie Diane. He uh, he renovated it. He, 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 had a, he had a system where he would turn on the sprinklers at the end of the night, and the sprinklers would wash everything away. <laughs> that big drains. He thought that was brilliant. I never heard of anything like that. But anyway, I put Rudolph in there. And it was the first time it was ever used. Yeah. Yeah. From what I understand, it had sat vacant for about 80 years after they stopped using it for storage. So it was it must have been a disaster when they first walked in there and said, hey, we're going to turn this into a nightclub. It wasn't just taking a paintbrush and a broom. There must have been a ton of work to do to get that place ready to to accommodate people, even though structurally you left the beams exposed and the concrete walls and all that the very industrial look it still had a lot of work to do to get it ready for a nightclub didn't it all nightclubs are like that in the beginning they're all a mess i, I i've taken clubs that are, you couldn't even imagine what i did to them and they turn out beautiful it's the job you gotta design it and i i, I never walked into a place like when i did marquee i i designed marquee i walked into that place it was a thunderstorm and the highlights, were, the skylights were broken. There was rain pouring down. Rats were running all over the floor. And Jason Strauss said, isn't it beautiful? I said, yeah, because it could be made. And it was made into marquee, which is beautiful, I think. And uh, I ran that place a few times. Or I promoted it on Wednesdays there. And it was a great rock and roll night I had. And it was great. And they're all terrible. They're all horrible places. And they are abandoned. That's the best place. Now, I understand that um, at the tunnel, they had a VIP area, and then they also decided there needed to be a V VIP area for the people who felt they were more important than the VIPs. Well, that's that's all a trick. There really wasn't a VIP. The VIP area, the tunnel was 55,000 square foot, and the VIP there was about 500 square feet. And those were a, a promoter named Jeffrey John, a few others who had their Euro crowd, didn't want to mix with the rest. But it, everything was VIP. The crowd was really amazing. Uh, we turned away thousands of people every night. Now, in the tunnel, how did the clientele differ from the clientele that you had at the Palladium? There was a lot of overlap. A lot of my crowd came, my trendy crowd. A lot of the gay people came. Michael Allen and his club kids were there. It was really good. It, it was, uh, I think it was great. I, I hung out with real celebrities. We had real musical acts uh, performing. We did fashion shows. We did, it was a club. It was a real club. And people liked it. Uh, the problem we had when Peter Gation took it over was that we had four clubs. We had Limelight. Palladium, Tunnel, and Club USA. So we had, a, we had to mix it so that one club was better than the other for some crowds. And we, we, we try not to compete with ourselves. Well, my attitude, which I told Peter, was if, if we're not going to take that club, someone else will, and then we will really be in competition with it. So we programmed it. So the people went to the line lot, became guido -y, club uh not club kid but more techno kids and tunnel was more adult 
And Palladium was uh, uh, adult, but more Euro. It went more that route. So what was it like when they transitioned? almost seems like Peter Gation was stalking you. Like he went to the clubs that you were involved with and decided that ultimately he should own them and control them and take oh, you, yeah. you know, under the wing too. Um, how, how did that change the, the way the clubs operated when Peter came into the picture? Well, Peter was the first real businessman in the night clubs. And I didn't get along much with Peter. No, I liked him. He, that's hard to say. This is the first. Uh, but I liked Peter. I, I respected him. And I worked for him because he was smart. I, I used to say I learned something new every day from him. But we each had our own, our own, own output, we own, our own agenda. But mine coincided with his. And uh, he had, my problem with Peter, I resigned from him a couple of times, was he had a girlfriend named Alexandra, who I introduced him to. It was a real bad person, a real grifter. And it changed Peter. And the Cubs went down after that. Now, my understanding with Peter is that his first, his first club was in Canada. But then yeah. in, when he came to the U.S., no, it's his first goal was in Florida. The first limelight was in Florida, in Miami. Yes, yes that's and correct. And then, apparently, um, he decided to expand to Atlanta. And I was in Atlanta when the limelight was there. And it had kind of its own exotic flavor. Um, I think opening night, they had um, Black Panthers under the dance floor. They had sharks under the dance yeah, floor. Originally, the, the, first, the first night or the first weekend, he had Black Panthers under there which he fought with PETA about, and they finally got approval to get them. And, ah, and they didn't, didn't want me. And it didn't work out because the Panthers didn't give a crap. They, <laughs> they would just lay on the ground and, and relax and sleep while people were dancing over their heads. So uh, they changed it and started doing the sharks and um, several other types of animals, I think, over the years. But, um, but yeah, and then so he did it in Atlanta. And then he comes to New York and wants to do it again. So apparently he was convinced that the limelight concept was going to be, you know, groundbreaking um, concept in the nightlife industry. Well, it wasn't. I, I went to the limelight in 89, I think it was. And uh, it's, inter it's interesting what you said about Peter, because I was a Peter member I uh, I got two pe people for the ethical treatment of animal uh, night uh, man of the year awards. I got at the Waldorf and all that, and I got that for banning fur from Peter's Cubs. I did ban it from the Palladium or Limelight, and we did that as a marketing tool. Uh, it, it it felt good, but we also did it because it it made people think about where they were to go that night. If they want to go to the Limelight, they couldn't be wearing fur, and that was a a leap that I thought was important, and they thought was important. Anyway, I don't know what, ha what happened with the Mike, but he opened up. He had Andy Warhol host it, and really nobody went. Some people went on some nights. It, it always, a nightclub will always have good nights, but in general, the public did not embrace it. Now, I, I was speaking with a friend of mine um, who lives down here in Florida now by the name of Clay Walkup, and he actually sent me a picture of himself and two friends coming to the limelight on opening night. And one of their friends was strapped to a crucifix and they carried him into the bar. And um, apparently that was at Andy Warhol's opening party at the limelight. Which may be the last really great party at the limelight. But then what happened was I was running uh, something and uh, I was out of work. The house of Butane closed. And I called up my mentor, Rudolph, and asked him what I should do. And he said, go away for the weekend, turn your phone off, and when you come back on Monday, everybody will be offering you a job. And I got offered the job at the limelight. Uh, Eric Good offered me uh, the building, and I, which was a very successful club. Uh, I could have done well. And I chose the limelight because the, the, the windows were so beautiful that I wanted to highlight them. And that was my first uh, design job where I renovated the limelight with my partner at the time, Colleen Weinstein. 
and uh, we made it beautiful. And we brought in a lot of people, but I had a hard time bringing people into that club because it wasn't fabulous. And even though I was fabulous, it was not a fabulous club. So I had to do a, uh, I, I did a B crowd as the A crowd. And once they got in, I could do A crowd later. And that, that worked. Now, my understanding is that the limelight had a peak in the early years. It was popular for a number of years and then started a, a slump and came back when Michael Alley became involved in doing his Club Kid events there. Is that your recollection of how things worked there? Yeah, that's about right. It was basically a uh, businessman and hookers before Michael came in. And there was not a lot of them. They never did a lot of people. I think most they did was 1,800. Uh, that was a record. Michael came in. And then I, when I w w lost my other job, Michael asked me to join him at the at the limelight, and I agreed. I, as long as I had certain control, which Peter gave me, and he told Neville Wells and Chris Williamson, who did Tuesdays and Sundays or rockish nights, that if I wanted them gone, they they had to go. And I kept them because it was a uh, really good. And I programmed people like. Uh, um, Jelly B. Benitez, Charlie Castano, a lot of people in into the limelight. We, we we did very well. And yeah, Peter then started to be the world famous impresario. I thought that was your title. Yeah. <laughs> it might be to the, the outside world, but Peter is, let's get something straight. Peter is fabulous. He may not know it, he may be doubtful, but he's a fabulous man. That's when people got along. Now, we've mentioned uh, Michael Alec a couple of times, and you've obviously partnered with him a couple of times. And yeah. I notice whenever I post anything that includes any image of Michael Alec online in my Gabe Archives group or in any conversation, there's always some haters out there that want to call him, you know, this scandalous murdering bastard or whatever. But my understanding from speaking to people like Michael Fazakerly, um, Ernie Glam, um, several people that I've interviewed that are familiar with the scene back then, he was actually at that time when you were working with him in the early years, he was kind of a, almost a genius at pulling together club events and getting people excited about it. Would you agree with that or? He was better than that. I used to think he was a uh, Andy Warhol modern version of him. Michael had a vision that when we got to the, uh, the world, there were no club kids, and he, he, we reached out all over the United States by doing TV with Geraldo and stuff like that. And we got, it was like a sending off a flare. All the club kids came in and we gave them jobs stuffing envelopes, doing coach app, busing. We gave them jobs just to feed them until they survived. They brought their friends in. And the scene just grew as exponentially. exponentially. Uh, he was a really nice guy. Michael was my best best friend. And uh, I have no shame about saying he fucked up. And when he died, it was, it was a result of years of drugs. And people should not hate Michael. He was a drug addict. And he succumbed to drugs. And so many of our friends died because of drugs. And so many of our friends lost their minds because of drugs. And Michael was just one of them. He really lost his mind. There was very little of him left when he died. And I, I at that point, I had, I had given up on him. And my wife had given up on him also. We were friends right to the end almost. But we couldn't. And Ernie Graham was with him. She, he roommated with her, him and uh, he was great for a while, and then he was great until he wasn't. Let's put it that way. And he wasn't great. But nonetheless, he had a big impact on not only the club scene in general in New York at that time, but also, I think, on a, a broader scale, on a national scale, on this whole kind of uh, gender identity issue, because so many of the club kids were, you know, straddling the line. They were wearing makeup and wigs or women's clothing if yes. they're men, and but they weren't trying to be women. They weren't trying to be drag queens. 
they were trying to express some sort of a, a flamboyant personality to get attention to, you know, start the party. And I think in a lot of ways, the club kid scene had a big impact on where we are today with, you know, the identities of transgender people um, and the acceptance of drag universally. You know, you look at RuPaul. Who would have dreamt in the days that you were working, you know, with RuPaul and Larry T back in, um, in the club days then, that RuPaul would be almost an international icon? I mean, unbelievable. Well, it's true. I, I, I thought she would go places. And Michael did have that influence. He had that influence on me. He, he was my better half, if you will. He taught me to be something. I was better with him at, at him than him in business. And I, the two of us made a good, good uh, team. I remember we used to do outlaw parties. And Michael would throw them and get thousand people to show up at a subway station and I would raid it with cops. I would call the cops up and complain and then they all come out with a red zone or Alice or whatever and we'd feed them. We'd give them drinks for free. He, he was innovative and um, I think he was a genius. It, it, it's very hard to look at with this light. It's very hard to look at the, him and say he was a genius because he, he, at the end his big act was killing someone. And which was not nice. But he was a genius up until that point. And he saw the killing of Angel as one last... His life was like a balloon. Each day he tried to expand that balloon by pushing in different directions. And killing someone was was uh, just a, a balloon for him. It just, it, he had, had very little moral at that point. He really didn't. But I remember him hitting me once at a club because I didn't give a drink ticket to a club kid who asked me one. And he was right. I should have given him a drink, drink ticket. I was wrong. I was distracted. And uh, Michael cared more about that than anything. And he didn't care about money. He made money, but he didn't care about it. And that's, that's it. And everybody wanted Michael. Now, you mentioned giving out drink tickets. And I've read in one interview uh, that you did a while back that over the course of your career, with all the clubs that you've been involved in in New York City, it was estimated that you personally had distributed probably $12 million in comp drinks. Oh, I did that on a Thursday. I, I, I handed out a lot of drinks. But why? First of all, it, it spurred drinking. If you give a drink ticket to someone, he'll have another drink and pay for it. So and some people will never pay for it, and you don't want him paying for it. Like George Wayne would come in, you don't want him paying for it. Uh, that was ridiculous. And you wanted him to come. And if you didn't give him drink tickets, he would go someplace else. You wanted him to feel like it was his club. I and mean, you put that in the budget. We spent a certain amount on drink tickets. And everybody accepted that. It's a good business. Well, but yeah, it was also good, good for the club. And if he's drinking free, he's probably going to bring a couple of friends with him or they're going to show up to see him and they're going to be buying drinks. So it's going to it's going to come come out in the wash. Yeah, it all does. We all look, we made a lot of money. There's no doubt. Peter Gation made so much money. Uh, the, Alan Cohn made lots of money. All these people made money. C. Ramel made lots of money. We gave away a lot of drinks. You had to give them away. You know, I'll tell you a funny Steve Robel story. He, when he made the original drink ticket, opening night of the Palladium, Andy Warhol designed the original drink ticket. I think he handed out 2,000 of them. At the end of the night, they counted seven of them and came back because everyone kept their drink ticket. Do you still have one of those? No, I never saw one. I never saw it. I don't even know what it looks like. <laughs> well, we'll have to see if somebody can find us a copy of it. I would love that. I would love to see one. Yeah, that's kind of amazing. But the story is that he gave it out and he got the credit in people's minds that I got a drink ticket from Steve Rebell. But he never had to pay for it. It was just really amazing, right? Absolutely. So you had all this experience over the years in all these clubs. Um, but you said Limelight was the first one where you really got to dip your toe in the water of design. What, what kind of design elements did you incorporate into Limelight to make it what people know it as today? 
Well, I exposed the windows, which were, which were covered up, and some of them were damaged. We fixed those, and we painted these ceiling arches a uh, lighter color so they would stand out. Then we uh, moved the bar from, we moved the entrance going up the stairs. So uh, we moved the bar right next to it. So we made a bar that was always dead into the hot bar because you wanted to go there. So these were things we did. And it really lasted for a really long time. That was it. And uh, that was it. I mean, I, I worked for David Marvisi later on, and he uh, did the limelight as uh, whatever he called it, some stupid name. Uh, and it didn't do well. But he kept the bar, and that did well. Anyway, it, was, it had many incarnations. It was a great, great club, and it's still doing things right now. Yeah. Was, it, was it Avalon? Was that the name of his Yes. Uh, no, it wasn't Avalon. It was something after that. Avalon may, may, may have been now Avalon. That was, that was uh, Stephen Edelman and some guys from the, uh, Avalon was the West Coast. That was Johnny Depp and all those guys. But it didn't work out. I don't, I don't remember what uh, Marvisi's place was. A state, maybe. A state or something like that. It wasn't, it didn't work. So somehow after working with all these clubs and getting your, your taste for design at the limelight, yeah. um, after a while, you kind of stayed attached to the club scene, but developed your own business doing club design and restaurant design. Did you have yeah. much training in that or was that just from what you learned on the job and, and your intuitiveness? I, I, I had no training except my, my parents did design their apartment out in Queens. My father put beams in and he put this in. I applied when I grew up what I knew. And I always had an assistant at that point, uh, Colleen Weinstein or David Davis, had people helping me, things I didn't know. And I, I, it was sort of a thing I, I learned as I got. And eventually I was hired by Richie Akiva and Scott Sartiano, who hired me to do butter. And I did Butter, which was a very successful restaurant and nightclub. And I, that was the first place I ever did on my own. I did it with a guy named Andrew from, L, from London. And we really killed it. That was place did well. And uh, it did very well. Uh, and then there's still a Butter group. It's now still one, there. One place I know you had a hand in is a place that I... I thought it was kind of an interesting project. Um, it was, um, I believe, in Hell's Kitchen, and um, it was an, an Ian Reisner project called the Alp Hotel. Yes. How did you get involved in that? God only knows. I took that job. I, I was offered a job every day. Every day somebody called me up and had a job. I don't have a business card. I just, uh, I did, but I, I never used it. People either knew me or didn't. Generally speaking, I was the go-to guy for clubs, and I was very successful. So they wanted me to do the out hotel, which is really uh, what I would call straight gays. It wasn't mixed at all. Very little mix. But uh, I, I had to do a club, and it's on my website. It's really nice. And I, uh, I, I channeled the gay. What you don't know is you look at that, there's a big sculpture over the bar. And that sculpture turns into a dick. And it's a, a, a metaphorical dick. And they all, all sat on the, in there and looked at it and said, that's a dick, isn't it? And it was. And I did it on purpose. And it was really cool. It was kind of a cool place. I love working with Ian Reisner. Re 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 and he was really cool. And... Um, Voss, something Voss. Um, but anyway, they were really good people. It was a really terrific crowd. I mean, everybody worked there. Everybody went there was a really nice person. And that, it brought me back to times when people were nice. And it was kind of a revolutionary concept to, to build a hotel, you know, in Manhattan that was not a little guest house or a little shabby four-room hotel, but to build a fancy, modern, you know, well-decorated, extravagant hotel. Um, I think he, 
in one of the interviews I've read about um, about Ian's plans for the hotel, kind of fashioned it after the concept of the standard in Miami that he wanted something to be, you know, two to five hundred dollars a night for a proper room. But he also had some lower priced rooms that were almost uh, micro tail style, little tiny studio rooms with a small shower and a bed or whatever. Uh, so they could accommodate more um, a broader spectrum of the gay clientele. And there was a nightclub in there, correct? Yeah, there was a big nightclub. Uh, my part of it was uh, um, was just a one room. It wasn't that big. But the other nightclub was huge. It held about 1,000 people. Was that the one that was called XL? So, eh, maybe, something like that. Yeah, it was probably called the XL. XL was weird. Was that John Blair's place uh, over there? I don't think it was XL. I don't remember what it was, but you can look it up. I, I don't know. It was a very successful nightclub and uh, very stylish. And set. They spent so much money on the handrails and lights. and It was really good. It was uh, really well done. I got the feeling that, um, you know, of course, I never visited the Out Hotel. And it's not there any. It's there, but it's not there as a gay hotel. The Playboy Club. Um, but I got the idea that um, Ian kind of took the the mindset of what uh, Ian Traeger did with some of his hotels in trying to be kind of Euro stylish and you know, like a boutique hotel design as opposed <laughs> as opposed to you know a generic. Um, hotel furnishings that you could get at some furniture liquidator or something. It was very no, design oriented. Very design oriented. I designed the, the uh, lounge, very expensive. The, the, the places where you sat, the banquettes were very expensive. The bar had wallpaper that you could paint. There were lights. And, oh my God, it was so expensive. But he, uh, he did well, he cashed in. I think he got in trouble. Uh, messing around with busboys or something and got in trouble. But other than that, it, it it'd probably still be there. Yeah, and I heard that um, there was um, a bartender who um, worked at another club. I'm trying to think of which club it was. He worked at another club in, in uh, Manhattan who uh, overdosed in his penthouse. And Yeah, that's right. That's what that happened. Was, that was, his name was Sean. And that yeah. was the end of um, Ian, uh, Ian as the the good guy. Took he was not a good guy, apparently, to, to many people. To me, he was great. But he, he, him and I had no problems. But when you, you see, the thing problem is when you're running nightclubs, and I run a few, you do things that are a little over the board, a little illegal, a little bad. Of course, that's the way you live. Every nightclub owner who ever lived, from Gations to Steve Rebell, all did drugs. They all were drug addicts or they did things. Everyone. I think one who did was Maurice Browns, who owned Red Zone. He did. But everyone else did drugs because it's what you do it for. You want to get in the nightclubs, so that's what you do it for. Now, with knowing Jason, who I started at the limelight, uh, they don't do drugs and they're fabulous and they make money but it's all about the machine making money, making money, making money and they, they have nightclubs all over the world to make money but they're business people they have structure and Ian didn't have structure he was just having fun he wanted to invest in this and he couldn't have invested in anything business wise and made money but he wanted to have fun so he, somebody died and that's what happens. And he wasn't really a, a club guy to begin with. He was a, a banker. He was a, a Wall Street guy. That's that correct. made a lot of money and then decided he was going to be in the club business. Or the, yeah, why not? You only go around once. You might as well do something you like. And that's the same with me. I, I just did something I like. I was working on Wall Street, being a, being a nerd. And I got into nightclubs. It's stupid. But I, I fell in love with them. They, they offered me a certain relationship with people. I hung out with the Ramones. I hung out with Anthony Kide, some of Grace Jones and Calvin Klein. I knew all these people. 
And uh, it wasn't it was better than working in a, you know, you know, in a bank. I tell you that working in Wall Street was boring. It paid more money, I think, but it was boring. Well, and you made quite a name for yourself. And even though you started, you know, at a younger age and you were a vibrant part of the club scene then, the club scene has still remained in your blood this whole time. It's not something that's vanished, whether you go out every night or not. Of course, COVID changed that for a lot of us. But you still have your hands in the club scene by doing your designs and, and going out when, you know, when you feel up to it. I also DJ. And I, I, that's the thing. I, I always do things that I couldn't do. I couldn't DJ. I, I didn't know the words of one song, but I did it as a challenge. And I became a DJ. I was on rock and roll. But I was at a lot of clubs. I did a lot of DJ. One night, one week, I did seven days in clubs. I was really proud of that. And I wrote for Black Book. I wrote a, a blog, uh, Good Night, Mr. Lewis. And I, I won Nightlight, Nightlight, uh, Night Writer Blog of the Year and you know, from the Village Voice. And I never knew wrote. I didn't know anything about writing. But I did. I just wrote in my own voice. And it was, it was well, well, well received. Well, and now... You have a lot yeah. of stories to tell from the experience that you've had personally. I mean, you've been in the scene for a long time. Yes, I have. It was, uh, the scene is a very strange thing because you may see something and it's very important to you and nobody else in the place can see it. It, it sounds strange, but I, I, I hung out with Timothy Leary because I booked him at the club with Michael. And I can't believe I met Timothy Leary and hung out with him and words with him. And Rod Stewart and people like that that you dream about, but I met them. And I met them on an equal field. I wasn't looking up to them. Once or twice, I, I looked at Prince. It was, I was in awe of Prince. But very few people, celebrities, impressed me. And that's the way it was. I mean, Peter Gabriel, I, I took him to the bathrooms. Leonardo DiCaprio, I took him to the bathrooms. I hung out with him. I, I, took, I got his mail. Uh, I was in People Magazine as his spokesman. I, I didn't officially a spokesman. I knew about him. So he asked me questions, and I answered them. And eventually I had groupies. But that's not why I was in it. I just did it for fun. And so I don't remember individual nights that much. There were no great nights, no bad nights. Some were great, but they were all really good. They all had a reason to be great. Yeah. Uh when I interviewed Bruce Valance, he made the comment about one of the great nightclubs in uh, Los Angeles. I believe it was Studio One. And he said, if you remember being there, you weren't there. It's true. That's it. There was so much going on. People don't like you. You talk about it in a very two dimensional way. The nightclubs, you were standing on a floor with thousands of people around you, lights going on, loud music. And you have to tell the story of what happened that night. Sure. You can't. You can tell the results. We did X amount of people. There was somebody there. And, but it was really more than that. It was, it was a place where people met people. That's what I remember. Where you, could, you could hook up with people and exchange ideas. Back then, people, fashion designers got their clothes out of seeing people in nightclubs. John Paul Gauthier would see people in nightclubs and put it in his next collection. Galliano, all these people saw it. And they expanded on it. Nowadays, fashion goes to like that comes out, out of it. But back then, we invented it. And I think Michael Allard did that to a large degree. Yeah, when I was interviewing uh, Ernie Glam, he designed, I think, most of the costumes that Michael ever wore. And um, he has a book out uh, called Dressing the Monster, which is about creating the costumes for Michael, um, for Michael Allard and the other some of the other club kids. And there are so many stories out there about famous designers. Uh, I think Thierry Mugler was one of yeah. them that inspired a whole fashion line for uh, a spring show based on what the club kids were wearing in New York City. That's right. Galliano, Mugler, Gautier. These are big designers. And they took it out of Michael or out of Dirty, or whatever you want to say. But they were inspired with what the kids wanted. They saw the kids and said, this is what the next wave is. Now, from what I remember from my clubbing days, I started going out um, to clubs in the late 70s. And 
what I remember from my club days is that club design was all about the impact it would make under the flashing lights and throbbing music. And there were some things you didn't worry about too much. A lot of times you would not worry about what the flooring was because nobody's going to see the carpet or the paint, painted concrete. But today you've, you've moved into kind of a new realm where those kind of details are extremely important. I mean, what I see from the designs you've done for hotels and restaurants and clubs, it's a, it's a different level of design than what you would have done back, say, in your limelight days, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I changed the way people thought of that. But then everybody, everybody did it. Now a place has to be done. I remember, um, remember the, going to uh, Maxwell's Plum and Jenny, La, La, Jenny Oz, Leroy owned it. And I remember going there and somebody would swing me around. And wherever I stopped, it was beautiful. Either the ceiling, the floor, anywhere it was done. And that taught me to be a designer. And I became a designer because of Werner Leroy's touch. I, I, I was influenced by him. Well, I've seen pictures of your run, of your club designs, and they are fabulous. I mean, every one of them is kind of jaw-dropping. You look at it and say, this would be perfect for a photo shoot, for a fashion show, for anything. I mean, just the, the environment is so rich and has so many elements that you can appreciate individually. And then when you pull them all together, they just make a huge impact. I mean, and they're not, and it's not a, a it's not a cookie cutter look. It's not like you have one idea and you change the color scheme in 12 different places. Each one of them has their own unique character. They all look different. I just said what you just said. My next client, I'm, I'm working on a club right now. It's the first club I've done in many years. It's four floors downtown, and I'm going to do it. Uh, I don't know if I can or not. I'm pretty sure I can. But it's. I told them, look at my clubs and find a similarity between two of them on my website. Find two that are the same. They won't. They can't find it. And that's what they wanted. They wanted a look that could travel. And my looks travel. They look incredible. And I would encourage everybody to go to your website and um, stevelewisdesign.com and take a look at the photo gallery there. You've got hundreds of photographs on your website of the clubs and restaurants that you've done, and they are all fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. I worked really hard to become a designer. I didn't go to school. I can't draw. I can't do a lot of things that really traditional designers do. But I, I have a feel for it because I'm unencumbered. I, I'm free. I dream of my design, and then I write it down when I wake up. And it works. It works for me. It works for them. Well, you, you have to have that creative element. You know, it's, you have to yeah. think outside the box. Um, over 100 years ago, Henry Ford made the comment that if I asked the world what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And he didn't think that way. And if you think creatively and you, you kind of expand your horizon and say, well, just because everybody else does it this way is not how I have to do it, then, you know, you come up with very original and very impactful designs. They're based in science, uh, things that science shows me. I, there's all sorts of trips tricks in it with light and mirrors and things like that that you don't see in most clubs. But then eventually you see it because they steal it or they are inspired by it better. But designers don't really steal from design. They get inspired by one designer and they apply it. But I, I'm very proud of my work. I'm, I'm going to do another one. This one will be fabulous. And that, that's what I'm working on right now. Well, I'm glad to see you're still making your mark on the entertainment scene out there. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time to tell us about some of your experiences in New York's iconic clubs over the years. Thank you. Really appreciate it. It was a good interview, and I feel very comfortable. I haven't given an interview in a while, and this feels good. Well, I'm glad we could break the ice. Okay, man. Thanks, Steve. See ya. That concludes another episode of the Gay Bar Archive Show. For more information about this episode or to find more episodes, 
visit gaybarchives.com.